So good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start with section uh, number three for this afternoon. And the chairs for this section are Professor Idliet Kober from uh, Technical University of Bucharest in Romania and uh, Claudia Caruso from uh, Institute Superior Technico in Portugal. You may start the section when you are ready. Good afternoon to everybody. Nice to meet you again on this last session for this time. And let me please introduce the first speaker, which will be Madalena Ponte, who co-authored her work, her paper with Professor Rita Bento, and it is titled Methodology for the Seismic Assessment of Complex Masonry Monuments, a case study of the National Palace of Sintra. Hello to everybody. Hi. Uh, as already mentioned, my name is Madalena Pont. So I suggest to change the order for the second person to uh, present, if you don't mind. For me, it's no problem, but we need to ask. So is there the speaker of the second presentation, influence of vertical irregularities on the seismic assessment of RC frame and wall frame buildings present and ready to present? Hello, can you hear me? I'm Victoria. Hello, Victoria. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Well, hi, I'm Victoria from the University of Seville, uh, Spain. First, uh, I would like to thank Professor Rita and the organizing committee. Uh, all those uh, hours of uh, hard work have resulted in a wonderful event. We all wanted to be together in Lisbon at Tecnico, but uh, unfortunately we will have to have a coffee and uh, the Facebook Miranda uh, just uh, adapting to this new situation. We'll do that online. Uh, anyways, uh, parabéns, um, felicidades, congrats. Um, I will present the paper entitled Influence of uh, Vertical Sea Regularities on the Seismic Assessment of uh, Reinforced Frame and Wall Frame Buildings, um, developed by me, Victoria, Rita Couto, Professor Rita Vento, and Professor Antonio Morales Esteban. Um, this study started uh, focusing on analyzing the reinforced concrete structures in Albalade, which is a neighborhood neighborhood located in, uh, in the north of, uh, of Lisbon city. Um, just, uh, just to mention, only in Portugal, the reinforced concrete buildings represent 50% of the total building stock. Uh, the, got the information uh, of, about these uh, buildings uh, were collected from the Archivo, uh, Archivo Municipal de Lisboa. We went there plenty of times and we gather this information in the ArchiArgis software. We identify more than 2,000 buildings, uh, of which uh, 28 uh, were reinforced concrete structures and uh, um, more than 97% of them were constructed prior to uh, this date, 1980, which is the year in which the first seismic code was published in, uh, in Portugal. We identified two structural configuration, uh, framed and uh, wall framed uh, buildings. Uh, in this workshop, we have seen that uh, irregularities can be found in, uh, reinforced, uh, in reinforced concrete buildings. They can generate additional torsional effect and soft story mechanism. They can worsen the seismic performance, and it is important to adopt adequate nonlinear modeling strategies and um, uh, strategies uh, or methods to predict the suitable response of uh, these uh, asymmetric buildings. We have identified uh, different typical vertical irregularities in the buildings. Uh, which are mainly the heterogeneous distribution of infields and the regular height of uh, columns. Uh, in this paper, uh, we haven't uh, studied the horizontal regularities. The main goal of the study is to analyze how these irregularities, these uh, two, may uh, or can affect the seismic behavior of uh, reinforced concrete buildings. We uh, chose two buildings as representative of the building stock in this uh, in the Alba, in the Albalade uh, neighborhood. The model one A uh, was suffering a wall frame building. It had uh, um, a wall in the middle 
of uh, the plan, and then uh, model B, which was just a frame, a frame building. Uh, we consider different structural characteristics, the materials, the slab uh, thickness, the beans and cold sizes. Um, we also consider the dead load, the dead and life loads according to the Euro code, and we applied the masses at the center of the, um, of the buildings. The numerical modeling uh, was carried out in OpenSeas. We uh, defined, it, uh, defined it the 3D numerical models. We consider nonlinear being columns elements uh, to simulate the nonlinear behavior of the, the structure. We used the section five fever uh, approach, uh, and we used the concrete zero four and steel zero two um, materials in OpenSeas. We also used uh, different safety factors according to the Euro Code 8 to reduce the strength of the material. We also consider the smooth uh, reverse effect by modifying the steel constitut constitutive law. And um, since the building is uh, the building, sorry, are of uh, reinforced concrete, we consider we also consider the rigid diaphragm effect. The infield modeling uh, was uh, performed by considering the two diagonal truss approach, um, which follows or which takes into account uh, a universal is a high theoretic material. With and this material is um, expressed as a four branches uh, for displacement relationship, which is, which is this kind of uh, relationship. And uh, the, influ the influence of the openings uh, was taken into account by reducing the stiff initial stiffness of, this, of the infield. And if we had a door, for example, as an as a opening, we reduce uh, that strength by 50%, following different uh, uh, works um, developed by Filarek and um, other authors. Uh, well, the, and also uh, the infill, the thickness of the infills uh, varied from 10 to 30 centimeters, which also, well, which was also uh, taken into account to obtain this uh, for the the force displacement relationship. We carried out the, a sensitivity analysis. We uh, we considered different model, models varying two uh, aspects: the position of the infill, which sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, these parts. We have the frame, the bare frame building, which has, uh, which doesn't have uh, infill, the partial infill building, which only has uh, uh, infills in uh, the um, floors types and not in the ground floor, and the totally infill uh, building. And uh, then uh, we also modify the height of the columns, and um, we had the regular model. And then the soft story mechanism, which we uh, increase these, the height of the ground floor um, columns. And, the sh and then we uh, consider another model, which was the short columns, because in the model B, uh, this building presented uh, uh, short columns in one of the frames. So we wanted to study that uh, irregularity. We performed no, no linear static analysis. We used the N2 method and its extended version to um, analyze the uh, curves, the infield curves. And then we also take in, took into account two load patterns in the X and Y direction, which were the uniform and the model pattern. And we, in order to compare the results, we had to normalize the curves by uh, dividing the base shear force and the top displacement uh, by each model's entire weight and height. We obtained the, well, first we performed uh, a model analysis um, and we obtained that all of the model's periods were lower in the X direction during the higher stiffness of the structure in this uh, direction. And uh, the, periods, the periods were reduced when we increased the number of infills. It can be seen here. In this, uh, it was in the case uh, number one, the bare frame and regular had uh, 0.55. And if we added uh, the infill, it, it started being 0.35. And then 
uh, 0.32. It was due to the increase of um, the model stiffness and the alteration of the model seismic performance. We obtained the pushover curves for each of the models. Uh, in this case, uh, these are the curves for the bare flame model, and we um, we uh, added the uh, different uh, irregularities in in the columns height. In, for the model B, which is the red uh, line, we obtained that um, the influence of the irregularities were uh, and could be considered negligible. But uh, for the model B, the capacity was reduced uh, up to a 20 percent. Uh, when we added the um, infills for the first, uh, firstly for the partitionally uh, infill model, um, it can be seen that they affect the uh, response of the model. In the case of model A, the red one, uh, the strength was um, uh, was um, improved in. Uh, up to 300%, and in the model B, only just the 25%. Uh, and we have seen that the enhancement of the performance does not lead to a better, um, to a better performance. And it's because we also obtained the, the shear failure and the uh, flexural failure, and we obtained that um, for the flexural um, and the shear failure, um, the displacements were uh, lower when we added the, um, the infield. And in the case of the total infield model, the, uh, for the, in the case of the model A, the capacity was significantly increased. And uh, for the model B, it was really no difference between uh, these uh, this, uh, course, which were the partitional, the infield models, and, and this one. Uh, the seismic safety was the checked according to the error code eight part three. We obtained uh, the seismic demand uh, was um, assessed in terms of the short rotation and the internal shear forces, um, and which uh, both of them should be smaller than the capacity values. And um, we obtained that the models do not comply with the fragile failure, but uh, they did. We, they, they did comply with the uh, doctoral failure requirement. Um, this leads to the um, following the um, most important conclusion of the uh, uh, of this uh, work, which is that a retrofitting solution should be um, added in order to prevent shear collapse. We also um, plotted the damage in different uh, vertical elements. Uh, we used the demand capacity ratio only for the flexural failure. We used the significant damage limit state as the critical criteria. In the case of model B, the damage is uh, mainly uh, is mainly concentrated in the in the ground floor. Here, you can you can see that uh, that um, all of the columns are um, are damaged. Uh, um, and in the case of the model B, the damage is mainly con concentrated uh, in the short columns here and the floor above on, for the partially infill models and also for the total, total infill um, models. Uh, and just to sum up, uh, the general conclusion that we, um, we obtain are that the periods uh, have reduced uh, the have been reduced when increasing the number of infields. In, in the infields can improve the seismic performance, but only if they are regularly distributed. If they are irregularly distributed, the results have uh, worsened. It. The influence, the inf influence have been similar in both building direction. This is mainly because uh, the buildings were in plan more or less symmetrical. And uh, the curves tend to present an unlike residu residual capacity, which is the capacity of the bare frame models. And uh, regarding the model's behavior, for the, uh, the model A, the worst uh, configuration was the partiality in fields and the soft story configuration. The damage is uh, concentrated in on the ground floor and the shear and the columns on the, on the wall will uh, uh, fail due to shear. 
And in the case of model B, the worst uh, configuration is the partial aligned field and the short column configuration, which is the real configuration. And, um, and also the um, short columns will uh, fail due to shear and uh, the floor above uh, will fail due to the bending. And uh, the main conclusion of this uh, work is that uh, we should, uh, we should uh, um, continue uh, studying these um, buildings and try to retrospeed them uh, to prevent the shear failure to, in order to comply with the Eurocode 8 uh, requirements. And um, that's all from me. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one or two short questions. Okay. Yes. Can I ask? Yes. You yes. Can. Okay. Victoria, thank you for the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. So my question is about the frames that did not have short columns. But in many cases, when the columns do not have enough stirrups, due to the infill of damage, uh, the columns receive forces within their spans, and actually this creates a problem of a short column. Uh, has this been considered? Because this may be a, a problem in, in such uh, buildings. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think that I didn't understand which is your question. Do you mean that if we consider the uh, hoops in the columns? No. So essentially, um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I understood how you um, modeled the infills, because in some cases, the damage in the infills um, actually, so, so did you use diagonals from uh, one joint to another? Or yeah, but yeah, we, we did that. We followed the, the approach that uh, was proposed in this uh, in this uh, paper and also uh, another papers that um, I can't remember the, the name of the uh, author, um, but I, I bet that uh, my colleague Rita might uh, might know that. But um, oh. yes, we followed the two diagonal truss approach, which um, which uh, which which basically uh, you will connect one joint with the other one, like a X bracing, like if you added an X bracing. And, um, but uh, in order to uh, obtain the uh, behavior of the material that we will later um, um, add to the OpenSea software, we had to consider the, um, the size of the, of the column and also the size of the bin in which the uh, infield panel is uh, embedded. I don't know. Can, but, I, can, uh, I, can I hear a comment? Yes. 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 Uh, in fact, we did not consider the, the possibility of having a short column effect due to the infields. Uh, so Victoria and Rita modeled uh, with this two diagonal truss approach from node to node. So very simple one. In fact, our infields, uh, only have um, holes in the middle, so they don't are not so uh, tend to short short columns effects because you don't have uh, infills up to a certain height uh, in in the floor. So, but this was not considered. It was a very uh, it was a nonlinear model for the infills, of course, but uh, simple simplified in the sense that it was not considered the possible effect of uh, of short columns due to infills. Mm -hmm. Okay, because, because sometimes the failure in the infill itself may, uh, um, may apply forces in the middle of the columns and, and resolve mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. that's something to, uh, for future to consider. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you have another, another question for Victoria? Be very fast. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a very short one. Um, thank you, first of all, for the uh, great presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, have you considered a nonlinear, geometric nonlinear effects? Because maybe I missed that in the modeling. Uh, the for geometry. the column? Well, we consider um, the nonlinear being columns elements to consider nonlinear behavior. 
of the columns and the uh, beans, and also the concrete zero four, which takes into account that uh, behavior. I don't know if that's what you mean. This is for material, but geometric ones. Sorry, can I answer? Can I help you? Yeah, read that. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, no, we aren't. We didn't uh, consider the, for example, the p delta effect. Uh, that's uh, a lack on our uh, paper. That we will, uh, we have to improve that. If that's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now we go to the presentation of Madalena Ponte, if she's ready. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the next speaker, speaker is Madalena Ponte, and the title of presentation is Methodology for the Seismic Assessment of Complex Measuring Monuments, Case Study of the National Palace of Sintra. Hello to everybody. My name is Madalena Pont, and I'm going to present to you methodology for the seismic assessment of complex masonry monuments, a case study of the National Palace of Sintra. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction, followed by the definition of the methodology, structural survey and experimental campaign, numerical modeling and calibration, the seismic assessment, and finally, uh, brief conclusions. So to introduce, large part of the built cultural heritage is composed of complex masonry monuments that due to their structural characteristics are vulnerable to the seismic actions. The, the, complexity, the complexity of most ancient monuments, namely their large scale geometrical irregularity, materials non-linearity, does not make its seismic assessment a simple task. Therefore, our main goal is to propose a methodology for the seismic assessment of complex masonry monuments composed of aggregate buildings using a famous Portuguese case study, the National Palace of Sintra, that is located in the village of Sintra nearby Lisbon. It is a palace of a large scale, very complex, that is composed of aggregate buildings, as you can see here, 15 in total. And to the definition of the methodology, our first step is to collect as much as information as possible uh, regarding historical data, the field survey uh, for the geometrical characterization, and in situ experimental campaign with uh, known and semi-destructive tests, followed by the definition of the seismic action and the safety and conservation requirements uh, following the codes. Uh, third, the numerical modeling and calibration with the equivalent frame modeling and the finite element model thing that will be discussed later, uh, taking uh, uh, a lot of attention to the boundary conditions that are uh, very important for this type of uh, monuments and uh, uh, using uh, uh, different uh, numerical models. So obtaining uh, different capacity curves. And last, it's seismic assessment, performing nonlinear static analysis for the study of the global behavior and nonlinear kinematic analysis for the out-of-plane behavior. Our structural survey and experimental campaign started with uh, the laser scanner and drone uh, campaign. We obtained an ordered point cloud, and after in Revit, we created a 3D beam model where it is possible to obtain uh, the correct geometry of uh, the entire palace and in all its buildings, which is uh, of the high importance for the, for the numerical models. Uh, regarding the historical data collected, this is one of the most ancient palaces in Portugal that still maintains its authenticity. It dates since the Arabic period, and uh, throughout the years it was uh, built, uh, different kings added different uh, buildings, as you can see here, until the 17th century. Our experimental campaign was performed in the several buildings of the palace. We opt to choose the, the buildings with the most uh, in structural importance and that characterize the different epochs in order to obtain results for the different uh, periods of construction. I'm going to present uh, uh, results just for the, the chapel of, of, the, of the palace. Uh, 
regarding the semi-destructive tests, uh, the flat check tests allowed us to obtain the quantitative results for the mechanical characterization of masonry. You can see here a photo of the masonry. It's a very regular masonry. Uh, rubble stone. Most of the palace is built in rubble stone masonry, except for the chimneys that are brick stone, and some uh, more recent partitional walls in one of the most recent buildings. They are also brick masonry. Uh, here, it, there, there is a graphic of the results of the flat check tests for all the entire. Uh, palace. You can see here the, the heterogeneity of the masonry that we have, some very stiff, others not so much. Also, uh, the samples collect, uh, collection that we obtain, it is uh, not with a lot of cohesion. Most of them were difficult to extract and difficult to obtain them in an entire. Regarding the non-destructive tests, uh, the ambient vibration tests performed allowed us to obtain the dynamic characterization of the bodies. It was of the utmost importance for the, the calibration and to understand the interaction of the buildings, buildings and its adjacent, adjacent ones. Here the, you can see the first vibration mode of the chapel. And finally, uh, the georadar tests that were performed in order to characterize, to characterize the construction techniques. Uh, we could uh, uh, understand here in the first picture, you can see that for most uh, thick walls, uh, there are two leaves of stone. And uh, also in the last picture, you can see marked in green that it was found um, and a later um, a window that was later uh, infilled and it was not uh, uh, detailed or uh, uh, it was not possible to know this information with uh, with the historical data so this test was also important uh, moving on to the numerical uh, modeling and to the calibration uh, we opt for these uh, such large scale complex monuments to uh, to create different uh, separate numerical models you can see here all the models that we did uh, they are several each for 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 each building and uh, we had to uh, represent of course the interaction between the adjacent buildings and for that we modeled part of the buildings uh, adjacent to the building in study for some buildings it was important to model just a few parts others uh, we had to model the entire adjacent building uh, most of the buildings that we modeled was with the equivalent frame modeling using Tremuri. And, but for two buildings here uh, showed, uh, the ones with the, the most more complex geometries, as you can see here, the chimneys that have a curved surface, it was not possible to model with equivalent frame modeling. And for that, we use the finite element modeling. And uh, I will show you uh, the, the comparison of the results in the next chapter. For the calibration, this is the most demanding part for the, this type of monuments. Uh, the calibration, it is very important and uh, it's only possible if you have the correct definition of the boundary conditions. And also the, the mass, it was necessary to calibrate using the state of distress obtained with the flat check test. The acceleration, acceleration of the seismic action depends on the type of soil found on the ground. Uh, for the main part of the palace, uh, the bedrock was in good state of condition. However, for uh, two buildings of the most ancient part, the bedrock was found with a few alteration phenomena, so uh, a weaker uh, soil had to be considered. The safety verification require, required was for the three limit of states, according to uh, the Euro code eight, we consider damage limitation, severe damage and near collapse. The near collapse was the most demanding one. And also the type of, of seismic action for far source was the most demanding considered. Regarding the seismic assessment, uh, for the global behavior, we perform nonlinear static pushover analysis. Here I'm presenting results for uh, the Bonnet building, where we use the Tremuri with equivalent frame modeling approach and Avox with the finite element modeling approach. 
you can compare here uh, the damage that we obtained. Uh, we found that uh, we had similar dynamic characteristics and similar results for of the seismic assessment. The pushover curves here for uh, uh, triangular and uniform load patterns in Tremuri and Abax. Uh, Tremuri results are a little bit more conservative with less uh, capacitive resistance and uh, less stiffness. Regarding the out-of-plane behavior, nonlinear kinematic analysis were considered. Uh, and here I'm going to present the Sijnj building. It is a building in the main facade of the, of the palace. It has uh, several arches and very and uh, large rooms with high, uh, with, uh, high heights. Uh, therefore, it is uh, uh, the, the out of plane collapse is uh, probably to, going to occur. So uh, we studied the two options because the building already uh, has existing tie rods of ancient uh, uh, intervention techniques. We didn't have information whether it, they were working or not. Therefore, we considered the first mechanism of collapse without uh, the tie rods proper functioning and the second mode of collapse with the uh, uh, tie rods working, as you can see here. Uh, regarding the safety verification for the global analysis, and this method was followed uh, with the code, uh, according to error code eight. And for the majority of the study buildings, the ultimate displacement corresponds to the formation of the mechanism of collapse and not to the decay of 20% of the maximum strength. Uh, for the out-of-plane analysis, uh, comparison of the values of seismic spectral acceleration of activation of the mechanism with the minimum spectral acceleration of the response spectrum was considered according to Italian building code. The response spectrum was amplified according to the height of the mechanism of collapse. In conclusion, the National Palace of Sintra is an example of excellence to study the best multidisciplinary approach to adopt for the seismic assessment of masonry complex monuments composed of aggregates of buildings. Experimental in situ tests are crucial for the, for the mechanical characterization of masonries carrying out flat check tests and the dynamic characterization of the structure with ambient vibration tests. Monuments of this complexity need to be modeled in separate models the most demanding task is to simulate the correct interaction between buildings, and the F, uh, AFM approach is suitable for the nonlinear assessment of masonry buildings and saves computational effort and time spent only for the this uh, com more complex and irregular geometry, such as the chimneys, it uh, is worthwhile to use the finite element modeling approach. Uh, for the study of uh, global behavior, nonlinear static analysis were developed, and for the local behavior, nonlinear kinematic analysis. These are the analyses required by the codes, and as seen with the National Palace of Sintra case study, are enough for a reliable assessment of complex masonry monuments. After the seismic assessment of the model of the monument, it is very interesting for the purpose for the purpose of management of the palace to insert the results obtained into the VIM model. As you can see here in the in this figure, we have uh, um, the several steps after the construction of the 3D model. You can insert your results, even the mechanical properties of the structure or the results uh, and the type of damages. Everything can be saved in this model. And thank you. Thank you, Madalena. There is a question for you. Yeah, hello. Hi, Madalena. Can I talk? Hi. I'd uh, like to ask a comment. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, really interesting. I'd just, just like to know what about uh, if you had a good correspondence, the values that you obtained uh, from the from the test that you performed, uh, as example, uh, from the project test over the measure types, if you had uh, at the end a good correspondence between those values and the one that you need in order to calibrate the mechanical models, the structural models, in order to, to match the dynamic modes of the, of the structure. Just uh, because, of course, we know that the project test is a, a specific uh, test that is performed over, over a selected point, and so there can be a lot of uncertainties about the the application of those values all around the building. And so I, I was curious about how did you manage between the uh, ambient vibration results and the mechanical 
results. I don't know yes. if it's clear. I, I didn't I didn't present he, present it here, but we obtained uh, very similar results regarding the ambient vibration tests and the model analysis of the numerical models. And uh, with that, we calibrated uh, uh, the interaction between buildings and also the mechanical uh, properties of the masonry that uh, we also considered taking into account the flat check tests and uh, uh, references uh, that from the Italian standards. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, is, was this uh, your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but at the end, so the final mechanical properties that you have applied was the, were they, really different from the one that you found uh, through the flat jack test as an example, or uh, ah, the one? Yes, flat jack test is a, a very uh, located uh, test. So in some cases, uh, uh, they were not so uh, similar. Uh, some other cases, they were very similar. But uh, most of all, they were all uh, uh, according to the results given in the Italian standards. So the, in the end, the results that we obtained were not so uh, different. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there are no not other questions. We'll go to next presentation. So next, next presentation is given by Beatrice Zapico Blanco. And uh, the title is Classification of Primary School Buildings influence of in plan irregularities. Hello, thank you. First of all, thank you for the organization and for the possibility of showing our, uh, our work in here. Uh, and congratulations for the event so far because it's, uh, it's going great. Um, now, my name is Beatriz Zapico Blanco um, and I'm here on behalf of my, of my team, of my whole team to present our work regarding the classification of uh, school buildings and also the influence of uh, in-plane irregularities on their uh, seismic behavior. Now, this small piece of uh, work that I'm gonna present here is part of a bigger project, which is called Persista. And that's a combined effort between the University of Seville and the University of Algarve, in which we have analyzed uh, the seismic resilience or the seismic vulnerability of school buildings of both Algarve and Huelva region, which are um, a Portuguese and a Spanish um, provinces in the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula, which is a beautiful place if you haven't been there. Most of you have. Uh, now, why school buildings? Because um, most of them are built before the, the seismic codes were issued both in Spain and Portugal. And also because um, the fact that there are a lot of children in those buildings make them vulner more vulnerable to seismic events. So um, we study them from the vulnerability perspective. Um, with that aim, we studied more than uh, 280 schools um, by researching all possible information uh, about them, uh, making inquiries, visiting the schools, and I'm not gonna talk in here about the whole uh, research on uh, all the buildings, but only part of them. In particular, I'm gonna concentrate on the schools uh, in, um, in Huelva, in the Spanish uh, part, in the Spanish province, and that's more or less half of the populations that we, that we have studied. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through the classification uh, work that we have done in order to identify this, the object of study for the second part of my talk, which is about irregularities, okay? So starting from those uh, 100, more or less 140 schools in the province of Huelva, the first thing that I have to say is that for each school, there are several buildings, one school, two buildings, three buildings, even six buildings. That makes a total of 270 buildings studied in this classification, okay? Now, the first thing that we did um, was to classify them based on their structural type. Uh, most of you would be able to identify these three types uh, blinded, right? So steel buildings, few of them, URM buildings and reinforced masonry, some of them, um, probably the, the, the oldest ones, but most of them uh, with a good 83% of them are reinforced concrete frame buildings. 
And that's why we concentrated on that typology. And now I'm gonna zoom in that typology and tell you more about that. Now, buildings in that typology, most of them present structural joints. That means that uh, the building is separated in blocks and those blocks are gonna behave independently. So here I'm talking about more than 300 blocks that have been studied. Um, within that typology, we can create subtypologies by looking at the um, geometrical shape of the building. For that, we have used, apart from our, um, our visits to the schools, also aerial photo cells, like the ones that you can see on the screen right now. And we have identified four main geometrical shape types for, uh, for these reinforced concrete frame uh, school buildings. And those are square, rectangular, intersection, and irregular. Okay? Uh, maybe it's easier if I use the last second. You can see that, right? Um, most of the buildings that we have studied fall, um, are, are part of the square or the rectangular um, types. In particular, 45 and 46% of them. Of those two, we choose to study the rectangular shape because in principle, rectangular buildings are more vulnerable regarding seismicity than square ones, right? We always choose the most regular uh, shape possible in order to make them more um, resistant. So in this case, we went for the less resistance, which are the rectangular ones. Um, those will be a 46% of all the reinforced concrete frame buildings. Within those, we've identified a further sub classification. So um, buildings could be either small, which only one story and reduced dimensions in plan, or slightly larger, what we call a medium building, which have two stories. Again, we have selected for the study the most um, vulnerable one, which will be the one with two stories, as most of you would reckon, right? And that brings us uh, through this classification into the object of study um, for the next part of the talk, which is a rectangular reinforced concrete block with two stories, okay? Which looks more or less like the one that you will see in the picture now. Now, starting from here, I'm going to the second part, which irregularities can be observed on this building, which, if you ask me, is quite regular looking from, from the top, right? Um, the main irregularity that we found is the presence of an atrium. And that is present in more than 40% of the buildings. Why more? Because we haven't inspected in person all of the buildings and some of the atriums cannot be seen from the outside. It's not that easy to look into um, all sides of the school from the outside. So um, we know that at least a 40% present an atrium. And why is an atrium an irregularity? Well. An atrium um, corresponds with a discontinuity of the perimeter wall. A discontinuity in a, in a perimeter uh, wall, which is um, a thick wall in the case of, uh, of this school, which is a, a, um, a wall that is contributing to the resistance of the building, is a potential change on the seismic performance of the building. And that's what we studied in more, in more depth. So um, we study it from two points of view. One is, what is the influence of the existence of, a, of an atrium, but also of its location and of its symmetry within the plan view of the building, okay? Now, for that, what we did was we selected a case study. The case study was one uh, school, with one building within a school, which was representative of this typology but also one uh, building from which we had a lot of information. As you can imagine, we, were, we didn't have enough information to characterize every one of the buildings that we have studied. For some of them, we, we could just guess. For this building, we knew enough for characterizing properly all the main elements of the, of the building, right? And with that, we created a 3D model, which looks like which you can see in here, right? Um, it has eight bays, nine frames. This is what we call the strong direction or the short direction. And Y is what I'm gonna uh, call the weak direction or the longitudinal direction, okay? 
Now, um, this model has no atoms, and it's what I, I'm gonna call the base model. And it's a model that we use to refer to and to compare uh, the, the behavior with the new ones that we created, including atoms in different positions. And in here, I wanna show you, um, sorry. Uh, in here, I'm going to show you the different uh, models that we have created, locating the atoms in different positions, right? We have uh, gathered the positions in corner positions, middle positions, or hybrid. What you can see here is a, a plan view of the building. The blue rectangle is the location of the atom that we have created, okay? So for each one of them, We've created one model, and actually we've created two models, one with the atrium only in the ground floor, and one with the atrium both in the ground floor and in the first floor. Um, here we are. So for each one of those models, um, using OpenSeas, we have performed an linear static analysis, so a pushover in the x direction and one in the y direction. I'm not gonna uh, go here through all the characteristics of the models because you can refer to the um, work done by my colleague Maria Victoria, which is um, uh, who is part of my team. And um, yeah, the, the use of uh, of OpenSys is the same. Uh, I'm gonna stop a bit uh, to reflect on the infields. We used, again, as she's playing in her job, two diagonal truss approach, um, a very simple one, node to node. And only, this is the important part, only perimeter infills, so bigger or thicker than 200 millimeters were included in the model. Why? Because those are the only ones that were considered contributing to the um, global resistance of the building. Now, um, with that in mind, I'm gonna talk about um, the results that we obtained, right? Um, if we look again at the plan view of the, of the different options that we have considered, and we reflect on what changes in the model when we include um, an atrium, let's look at the very simple one, the C1, for example, we just add a small atrium in a corner. What happens when, when, the, when the atrium is present? Well, what happens is that one perimeter wall disappears, and it's the one that you can see in red. But a new perimeter wall, so a new contributing wall appears, and it's the one that you can see in green. So when we are pushing in the Y direction, which is the long direction, the effects should be minimum, right? However, if we go to the middle of the building, like the middle, uh, the, these four models, the M models, you can see if we look at M2 and M4, that we are removing two sections of the infill walls, the perimeter walls, right? And no new walls are included. So this must have an effect on the capacity of the building, right? In fact, if we look at the capacity uh, curves in the Y direction, in the, in the long direction of the building, we can see here Let's concentrate in, in this part, the one in the middle, right? Um, you can see in blue the capacity curve of the base model, okay, with no uh, atrium. When we add the atrium in the middle, which would be the models M2 in gray and M4 in green, you can see that the capacity goes down. And that's more or less what we were expecting, right? Because we have removed some of the walls. The effect is not that we, we removed one and we included another one, so no big deal. What happens if we look in the strong direction, in the x direction? This is the x, the, the x direction, right? So um, if we look to the in the corner atriums, it's more or less the same thing. Although the walls that we are including are closer to the core of the building, so that can have a, a positive influence somehow in the capacity of the building. However, the big difference, if we look at the ones in the middle, is that we are including some new perimetral walls and we are removing none. And again, that has to have some influence in the capacity. If we look at the capacity curves, and again, the blue is the base model, 
and we look again at the at the models M2 in gray and M4 in green, we can see that the capacity is going up in this case. And not by a little, it, it's really going up. Regarding the um, torsional effects, of course, if you add um, an atrium in a location which is not central, uh, or if the atrium is quite big um, uh, when compared with the total uh, surface of the building, the, there's an effect in, in torsion, the one that you can see here. No torsional effects are observed in the base model, of course. And with this, I would just sum up. Um, in this case, when we are talking about rectangular, medium-sized, reinforced concrete two-floor um, school buildings, if we are not taking into account the effects of natrium, we are, of, of, um, we are getting unrealistic results, okay? When we look, I didn't mention this in the, in the results, sorry. Um, I mentioned that we've made one model with the atrium on the ground floor, another model uh, equally to that one, but with the atrium both in the ground floor and in the first floor. Well, it doesn't change. When, it, when the atrium is already in the ground floor, it doesn't matter that you add it in the second floor. Um, the effect is already there. And um, what would we like to keep on studying about that? Well, we are still curious regarding what is the effect of the number of bays. What is the effect of the of the relation uh, x y relation uh, ratio of the building, and also on the total length of the of the facade? But that will be for future editions. And um, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Here you have the sway of the Fasista project if you are interested, and I would like to thank you again and thank my team for participating in this uh, nice piece of job. Thank you. Are there any questions? If not, if I would just like to address one short question. We may uh, yes. wanted to ask yes. the one question for how did you model the ground, the facial ground? Where was your building fixed at its base? Oh, sorry, I, I was not able to unmute. Uh, yes, this is a this is a very simple model in general, and it's fixed to the base, indeed. Okay, thank you. And Thank you for the question. Marina, I believe Professor Marina or, or Marina wanted to, to address a question. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. My question is about uh, the, um, the uh, element that you have used to the model uh, beams and columns. And in particular for beams, you used the nonlinear beam column, if I understood. And also, you uh, considered a rigid diaphragm at yes. each uh, floor. Uh, now, when we use uh, a nonlinear beam column uh, plus uh, rigid diaphragm, uh, we observe a, a rising of a fictitious axial force in nonlinear beam column that uh, modify the flexural strength of the beam. Now, okay. I, my question is if, uh, if you have considered this problem and uh, how do you think that uh, this can affect the final result of your research? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It's very, very constructive, uh, very constructive question. Um, uh, my colleague, Maria Victoria, was actually in charge of the, of the modeling in open seas. Uh, so maybe he can correct uh, my words, but um, as far as I know, we were not taking that into account. And that would be a, a good point to, to, for further studies, to just refine our, our models regarding that. Um, Maria Victoria, I don't know if you want to add something to, to this. I, I'm taking good note. Um, yeah, um, yeah you're, you are right. We didn't take that effect into, into account. We just consider the... Um, the, oh, we use we just use the nonlinear beam column element, but um, right now I'm trying to use uh, different elements um, in, in the work that I'm uh, currently developing, and I'll try to include that because I didn't think that it could be that important. But uh, thanks for your oh. uh, feedback. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, we have uh, developed um, a solution 
to mm -hmm. avoid this problem. And uh, if you think that this can be useful for your research, we, we can talk later. I can give you some material. Perfect, perfect. I'll write okay. you an email. <laughs> okay, thank you for Thanks. the answer. Thank you, Professor Marino. We'll be certainly we'll be in touch with you. Thank you, please. Thank you again for your presentation. Very nice work and wish you luck with your future work in this respect. Please let us move forward to the next presentation. Uh, I want to introduce Mr. Lopez. He will present a paper entitled Modified Model Response Spectrum Analysis of Plan Irregular Highly Torsional Listed Structures Under Seismic Demand. Uh, good morning. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Saul Lopez. I'm uh, from the uh, Fesacatlan campus of, the, of UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, and I'm going to present you, uh, to give you a brief presentation of the contents of the paper, Modified Model Response Spectrum Analysis of Plant Irregular Highly Torsionally Stiff Structures Under Seismic Demands, which was done with the collaboration of a student at, at, at my uh, state campus, Daniel Juan Carlo, uh, and uh, which uh, was also uh, Elaborated by Dr. Mario De Stefano and Valerio Alecci, Dr. Valerio Alecci from the University of Florence, and uh, Dr. Gustavo Ayala from the uh, Institute of Engineering of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Okay, well, uh, as it is of, uh, of as it is well known, uh, model response spectrum analysis uh, is the most uh, used um, tool for the analysis of structures uh, for the purposes of seismic design and assessment. However, uh, also it is, of, of very, it is well known that uh, it is strictly valid only for elastic systems, not for inelastic ones. But it provides uh, an, an approximate uh, and simple way uh, to analyze our structure uh, for practical design. Uh, <coughs> in, for instance, um, the uh, model spectral analysis is used in conventional force-based uh, design procedures, such as those prescribed in building codes, and also in displacement-based design procedures, uh, such as the N2 method, which is uh, currently uh, very much used in Europe. Uh, however, there is an issue of particular concern uh, regarding uh, the use of model uh, response spectrum analysis for the design of plan irregular structures under severe earthquakes. This is uh, to design them for the uh, ultimate limit state in which inelastic behavior is expected. Uh, regarding this subject, uh, the Stefano and Pintuki in 2010 uh, uh, did a parametric, a parametric analysis of one story uh, shear frame models, uh, which would be which were representative of actual buildings in some of their uh, properties. And they showed that for moderately torsional stiff systems, uh, which is which this means uh, uh, quantitatively speaking, uh, uh, stiffness radius of duration values less than 1.5. Uh, for those systems, maximum inelastic flow rotations uh, are usually smaller than the than for maximum elastic flow rotations. Thus, uh, this uh, would imply that the use of model response spectrum analysis. Uh, to design uh, in the last, uh, this, this type of systems uh, would provide conservative results. On the contrary, uh, the same authors uh, show that for highly torsional, highly torsional stiff systems, this is with omega values uh, larger or equal than 1.5, uh, which would be uh, the case of buildings with uh, perimetral shear walls. Uh, the inelastic flow rotations of uh, inelastic systems are usually larger than the, than, uh, than the maximum uh, elastic flow rotations. Uh, hence, uh, moral response spectrum analysis would provide uh, conservative results for such type of, stru of structure. Uh, for highly personal stiff systems, uh, such as buildings with perimetral shear walls, uh, maximum inelastic flow rotations are usually smaller uh, than those of elastic systems with 
with, with the same uh, plan characteristics. And, and hence, model response spectrum analysis may provide unconservative results, uh, may provide unconservative results for such type of, stru of structures. Uh, this um, uh, specifically, this would mean that maybe uh, uh, structures designed uh, irregular in plan designed with, with model spectral analysis, uh, specifically shear wall buildings would, would be, uh, well, would have unconservative results if you use model spectral analysis. And uh, for instance, if you would use the N2 method to design uh, a floor asymmetric, in plan asymmetric structures, uh, in the N2 method, uh, you would uh, superimpose the results of model response spectrum analysis to the pushover analysis to estimate floor displacements. And this would mean, this would mean that you would also have, uh, may have underestimation for these type of systems. Okay, so uh, this sh study shows that an improved estimation of maximum seismic demands of these type of systems, highly torsionally stiff ones, may be attained via model response spectrum analysis of a modified elastic model in which the center of mass is displaced at distance termed additional mass eccentricity, which is a function of the plant aspect ratio of the building, the uncoupled translation, translational period of the building, the stiffness strength eccentricity, and the seismic uh, behavior factor Q. Uh, and such values of uh, the, this uh, so-called additional eccentricity uh, were defined through an extensive parametric analysis uh, of highly torsionally stiff one-story shear buildings uh, subjected to ground motions compatible with the EC8 elastic design spectrum for zone one and soil type B. Um, specifically, uh, the case studies considered uh, in these investigations uh, were one-story shear buildings with rigid diaphragm of rectangular plan, which are representative precisely of shear buildings with perimetral walls. Um, and these uh, case studies were modeled uh, for a wide range of values of the main parameters involved in torsional response, which are the ones that I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, the plan aspect ratio B over L of the, of the plan of the building, which is the one that I'm showing to the right. Uh, the period in the, in the short direction uh, and RT, R sub YT in this uh, equation uh, would mean uh, the ratio of the stiffness in the x direction to the y direction. Uh, ESX is the eccentricity, uh, the this, this, uh, stiffness eccentricity of the building, and Q uh, is the seismic uh, reduction factor. Uh, so uh, the values that we use for each of the parameters are shown here. So we uh, carried out a series of nonlinear dynamic analysis of these models. Uh, using uh, uh, an ensemble of seven earthquake records from the European Strong Motion Database, uh, corresponding to zone one and soil type B, as I previously mentioned, uh, which were uh, the ones used in, in a previous study by the Stefano and Pintuki in 2010. Uh, so this, uh, this series of nonlinear dynamic analysis uh, was performed using OpenSeas. Uh, the case studies were designed via model spectral analysis using the reference design spectrum. Uh, reduced by the seismic reduction factors that I already mentioned. Uh, and the strength of the structural elements was distributed in proportion to its st stiffness uh, to achieve that the uh, strength eccentricity would be equal to the stiffness eccentricity, which were this, the type of case studies that were uh, uh, used in this, invest in, in this instance of this investigation. Uh, linear and uh, well, the solution of the dynamic equilibrium equation of the nonlinear dynamic analysis was attained via numerous average constant acceleration method along with Newton Raphson. And Rayleigh, Rayleigh damping was used uh, for uh, considering a damping ratio of 5% for the first two modes of vibration. Uh, so the results of the nonlinear and linear and nonlinear dynamic analysis are shown here. Uh, in this plot, specifically, I'm showing you uh, the uh, in the ordinates, the amplification, the ratio of the displacement of the flexible side of the building uh, over um, the displacement of the center of mass of the building. This was done for the uh, stiff, for the case studies which had uh, these parameters that I already mentioned before. Uh, so as you can see, uh, well, the black line corresponds to systems, to elastic systems, 
Uh, the other colors uh, show uh, the, the amplification of the flexible side of the inelastic system. So in all case studies, uh, well, it, it, in almost all case studies, uh, well, it was found uh, the same that the Stefano found before. Uh, we actually used uh, some of the results. Um, uh, we used some of the results uh, previously, uh, previously obtained by them, and we complemented them with more. And so we obtain uh, also the same trends. And the displacement amplification of an elastic system is significantly larger than elastic ones. So, um, uh, so the premise of this work is that a better estimation, as I previously mentioned also, is uh, a better estimation of maximum inelastic response for highly torsionally stiff systems may be achieved by using or by uh, putting to the model an additional mass eccentricity. Uh, and therefore, in this approach that we're proposing, uh, the design eccentricity of the elastic model would be defined as the actual eccentricity value plus the additional eccentricity. And um, this artifice, uh, the results obtained from this analysis, uh, which have, would have to be corrected, uh, or, or let's say that we uh, modify our model for us to have this additional eccentricity. And it would, it, the results obtained from such analysis would have to be uh, adjusted by the correction factor because, uh, well, this would be clear in the following slides because of the way that we define this, uh, this additional uh, uh, design eccentricity. Okay, and in the preceding equation, um, uh, delta CM would be the displacement uh, at the center of mass of the original model. This is with the original eccentricity ESX. Uh, delta CM, uh, this one uh, would be uh, the displacement at the center of mass of the structure modified with this additional mass eccentricity. And theta CM would be uh, the displacement, um, at the, sorry, the floor rotation at the center of mass uh, of, the, of the model with the modified uh, with the modified eccentricity value, additional eccentricity value. Okay, so this one uh, and the, each, uh, the values of the eccentricity were obtained via an iterative scheme in which a series of nonlinear, of linear dynamic analysis of elastic models of the case studies in which, e, uh, in which the eccentricity was valued uh, for an elastic system uh, in such a way that the median uh, Amplification factors, so the medium, uh, this is the displacement of the flexible side to the displacement of the center of mass of this elastic model with the modified uh, eccentricity uh, would be the same, the median for the corresponding inelastic system. So uh, these are the plots uh, that we obtained. Uh, th these are the plots that we obtained from the, uh, from, from this analysis. Uh, the, uh, the, this, Type of stepping uh, in the in the plots uh, would be an indication of the type of iterative scheme that we used because uh, we iterated. So in order for us to get the same medium response, instead uh, of getting uh, an individual eccentricity for each record, uh, because it, it would be uh, doing it this way, it would have a lot of dispersion uh, in the values, and also we obtained some plots that were uh, very difficult to fit. Um, um, okay, so this is are the types of plots. These are the ones obtained for systems uh, with these parameters uh, values obtained right here. And we, uh, in this study, although we focused only on one story shear models, uh, we tried to derive some equations uh, that maybe that uh, are useful for what we're doing uh, currently right now. And so we tried to adjust uh, for this uh, simple uh, simple models uh, equations. Um, uh, to calculate uh, additional eccentricity. Uh, of course, uh, this feeling was done, um, was, well, we firstly uh, fit or, or we define a linear, uh, a tree linear zone uh, regarding the period dependency of this, of this additional eccentricity value that we obtained. And then we, perf we perform, uh, we fit it at the coefficients that we obtained uh, for this uh, values, uh, 
Uh, we're fit, uh, considering as independent variables, uh, the parameters, uh, the aspect, the plan, the plan aspect ratio, uh, the stiffness eccentricity, and the uh, and the, in the last and the seismic uh, reduction factor. So uh, these are the equations. Uh, these are the equations that we obtained. So I'm going to put them uh, uh, really quickly. And well, the uh, they provide an acceptable approximation of the actual value uh, that we obtained from the iterative scheme scheme of uh, of AID, EID, and the coefficient of determination of R squared was uh, it was about 0.89. In some, and here I show some of the of the results of the regression. Uh, it, it was quite difficult to uh, to give an appropriate match due to the irregular data, but I think that they provide uh, an adequate approximation. Some details on their use are given in the paper. And Finally, I am showing you, uh, which was uh, the most important thing of the results, uh, the medium floor displacements obtained uh, from the linear analysis of the modified elastic models with this additional mass eccentricity and scaled by the seismic, uh, by, by this, uh, sorry, the correction factor C sub F. And we will do, we will see the comparison of the floor displacements. Um, in the in the left uh, figure, uh, we are showing the inelastic uh, floor displacements of the system with these parameters. Uh, this would be um, the elastic. Uh, the dot black line would be the elastic directly obtained from the analysis of the model uh, with uh, with this modified mass eccentricity, additional mass eccentricity, without any correction. And the blue line uh, would um, uh, uh, shows uh, the corrected elastic, uh, the corrected floor displacement uh, of the of the simplified uh, of the elastic model with the additional mass eccentricity. And here I show the same. Uh, and as you can oh, yeah, see, the errors are not very large. Okay, just one minute. And for most cases, the displacements of the flexible side are slightly overestimated. Uh, but the mean error among all case studies is 1.42%, and the standard deviation is 7.18. Uh, so I think that we have uh, um, uh, a good match uh, of the results with this uh, simplified elastic model. And so the conclusions are um, an improved estimation of the seismic demands uh, may be achieved uh, for this type of systems, uh, uh, shear, um, uh, highly torsionally stiff buildings. Uh, maybe achieve via model spectral analysis of this modified elastic model. Uh, well, these artifacts may be used uh, for displacement-based procedures such as the ENFO method or even for conventional uh, force-based design procedures, the most commonly used. And well, of course, we did this study only for one-story buildings in, 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 this, uh, in this stage of the investigation, but I think the results obtained would suggest that it, we could use it on multi-story buildings. Uh, thank you, and uh, please excuse the inconvenience. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if there are questions. Maybe we have time for a very short one. Otherwise, we go to the last uh, presentation. So, okay. Thank you so much. Um, the last uh, uh, speaker is Andre Belejo. And the presentation title is uh, Ground Motion Duration Assessment of a Plan Asymmetric Reinforced Concrete Building. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So, my name is Andrea Blaiso, and I am presenting the work. Uh, conducted by me, Andrea Barbosa, and Rita Bento. And it's called Ground Motion Duration Assessment of a Plan Asymmetric Reinforced Concrete Building. So, um, okay. So in the past, we had many many destructive earthquakes, and some of them can be classified as short duration earthquakes, and some can be classified as long duration earthquakes. As examples of short duration earthquakes, we had the Imperial Valley, Loma Prieta, Norridge, and Napa. Um, and on the, 
and has long duration ground earthquakes. We have recent examples of Japan, Tohoku, Chile, and Indonesia. And we kind of expect that Portugal and the Cascadia subduction zone are, are expecting a, a long earthquake too. So the research question in this in here is, is the ground motion duration important when, when estimating structural response and damage? So to answer that question, so sorry. So to answer that question, we need to define ground motion duration. So we classify long motion rate, a lo long duration ground motion, as a ground motion that has. Uh, uh, areas intensity of at least 25 seconds. And the areas intensity be between 5 and 70% uh, will last more than 25 seconds by following the work of Chandra Mohan at all. Also, we need to classify damage. And for this work, we use two damage indexes to classify damage. Those damage index indexes are a function of the analysis, peak deformation, ultimate deformation and hill deformation of the structural members, hill strength of the structural members, dissipated energy, and parameters calibrated with uh, laboratory tests. So a little bit of background here. So is ground motion duration important? There are many studies that addressed this topic and came up with no correlation with, with drifts. Some other studies came to the conclusion, came to inconclusive results. And then in 2006, Kramer and Mitchell started to see some influence on the on the pore pressures in the liquefiable soil. Um, but then this was before we had the capacity, the capability to develop um, in cycle deformation models, degradation models, I'm sorry. So uh, around 2010, many in cycle degradation models were developed and now they're included in our softwares. So uh, in the, during the last decade, the con those, this topic kept being studied and some of the conclusions started to change. There were, there's correlation in peak interstory drifts with shaking intensities showed up, large residual deformations in long duration earthquakes, uh, increase of collapse risk due to the duration of earthquakes and also increase of accumulated damage. But again, so most of these studies still didn't consider 3D analysis. So in this study, the purpose of, the purpose of this study is to understand, to understand how the duration effects uh, um, are, how the dura how duration affects the 3D building with planning irregularity. We use OpenSeas as our software, and we use the well-known Spear building, which was a building that was full-scale tested in Italy. It was subjected to a, a, an earthquake Arsagovi record with a big ground deformation of 2.2 G. Is irregular in plan. Um, then, and as an elongated column, C6. And so the, mod, the concrete model and the steel, or the rebar steel model, we make sure that they were in cycle 
we use in, in cycle degradation models and we conduct our analysis. So to validate the model, we first compared the column deformations with the one from our model to the ones in the tested, the ones tested in the laboratory. And we got to very, to time history responses very close to the ones in the test. And also we computed the, the damage indexes in using open seas. And we compared to the ones, to, to the real actual damage of the specimen. And we got to the conclusion that we, um, we have uh, very, it, it's very similar uh, conclusion. So in terms of damage, we obtained severe damage in column C3. We, um, we, and we get slight spalling, like can be considered moderate damage in calling C1. But to do this study, so the main, uh, a very important piece is the ground, the selection of the ground motions, because we need to have similar short and long ground motions to make sure our results are, to make sure our results are, make sense. So to make, to do this, we first selected 32 long ground, long duration ground motions. And those ground motions were selected based on the response spectrum uh, of uh, the response spectrum uh, for the building. And then for each long, long duration ground motion, we select a short, only one short duration of motion. But to select that one, we had a large set of short duration ground motions. We, for each short duration of motion, we, we made an algorithm too that included the rotation of that short duration long motion on a whole 180 degrees, and then compared the short, by scaling the short ground duration, we compared the response spectrum from the short long duration to the long duration. With that, we had associated to each short duration a, a rotation factor and a scale factor. And we did that for the two components of the ground motion, short and long, um, east, east, west, and north, south. So, and here we have an example of a long in gray, a long duration ground motion, and in black, a short duration ground motion. And this was the equation to, to identify the, the discrepancy between both. So we performed idea analysis for the set of short duration ground motions and for the set of long duration ground motions. And here we have the IDA curves, the median, all the IDA curves plus the medium IDA curves. And here we don't identify effect of long duration ground motions. And then at the right, we have the energy dissipated by the long duration of motion and, and, and due to the short duration of motion. So in here we can see that we have a factor of three to four times more energy dissipated when, when the building is, is subjected to a long duration of motion. Then we compute the called damage index based fragility curves. And this is, those curves are those, sorry. So it took to compute these curves basically for each earthquake, for each ground motion, we compute the damage index of each 
uh, in the structure. And, and for each increase, and inc by increasing the intensity of the ground motion, we, we, we computed the damage index for each intensity. So the same thing we would do for interstory drifts, we here did for damage index. And here we could see that for long, for the park and hang damage index, long duration long motions have an overall, an overall uh, pro more probability of failure for larger intensities for moderate damage. And as we saw before, moderate, we classified moderate damage when the damage index is between 0.25 and 0.4. For severe de damage, where the damage index will be over 0.4, we didn't find uh, huge differences. Only for the really high intensities, we found that long, long, long duration earthquakes have, have some impact here. Then we compared the, the medium fragility curves based on the damage indexes to the fragility curve based on interstory drift ratio. And we did that for short duration uh, ground motions, long duration ground motions, and for a probability of severe damage. We know from FEMA 356 that severe damage is considered when we have interstory drifts higher than 4%. So we use that to compare our damage index agility curves. We see that for short duration, they pretty well match. So that basically validates our agility curve development based on the, on the damage index. And we go to long duration, we see that for the damage indexes have higher probability for the same earthquake intensity, which can tell us that there's there's some there's some effects based on the duration. As conclusions, so the duration does not play a role in terms of peak deformations or torsional responses. The damage estimator using the damage index that shows that ground motion duration plays a role for greater intensities. While long duration motions and severe damage states, differences are obtained between uh, interstory drift ratio based and damage index based fragility curves. For they're not they're negligible for duration motions. And and here we can basically say that new prop collapse fragility curves based on damage index were developed for uh, non-ductile buildings to account for duration effects, which can be used for regional analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Are, the, are there any questions? I would have one short question, if possible. Um, I wanted to ask you what type of uh, ground motions did you consider? Right band and also pulse type? Can you, can you repeat the questions? What can you type, what yes. type of ground motions did you consider? Right band motions or also pulse type? Uh, we we consider the subduction zone ground motions, so the Tohoku, Chile, so those are mega thrust earthquake subduction zone um, earthquakes, and then we use the crustal earthquakes. So we and we didn't exclude any type of uh, fault type um, um, motions. We only. Like we only exclude the, the ones we both like uh, ground motions. So that would have different effects that we don't want, we didn't want to explore here. I don't know if I, if I re answer your question. I, I cannot assume because it, I, I cannot know what, what ground motions you did take into account. I just was wondering, I don't know them. 
you know them by name, you know them by shape, you have used them, I don't know them. And that I was a little bit curious about if they are all bright bands, right? So you have a lot of pulses equal strong, or if they are pulse types. So you have maybe one big pulse which concentrates most of the seismic energy. But we may so, discuss it later on also. So sure. But so I was mentioned, we ex we exclude for our ground motion selection, we exclude the pulse type one. Okay. Because that one would have undesired effects for this type, for this study. Okay. Thank so you. So we only, yeah. Thank you. Okay. There are not other questions. We go to the closing session without making a break because we are already behind schedule. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing the last question, the last session, sorry. So as we are running out of time, we are moving directly to the last session of the workshop for the final remarks, discussion and closing. 